What's up all you golf nerds and swing geeks out there? How's everybody doing? Welcome to Guru Friday. I am your host, Jason Sutton, aka The Guru, where I answer questions from coaches from all over the world. I hope you've enjoyed all the interviews with my high-performing coaches and all the people that I've had on the show, but this show is all about you, the listener, the teachers and coaches out there that want to get the answers and want to get the good stuff. So before I get down to our first question, I want to thank all of you for supporting the show. Uh, The subscriptions and the downloads are increasing by the daily, and I just can't tell you how grateful I am for all the feedback on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, It's just been incredible. Uh, I'm truly grateful for your support. So feel free to to share with others that you think might help uh, their teaching or their coaching or just golfers out there that want to get the personal development stuff that we're throwing out. Also, don't be afraid to to reach out to me on the Twitter uh, and Instagram at Golf Guru TV. I uh, love to hear from you. I appreciate uh, the tweets that we've gotten, uh, all the DMs uh, that I've gotten as well, uh, saying that they enjoy the content. So I've got a lot of uh, really outstanding guests coming down the line here shortly. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to talk to a college coach that I think is going to give you some really good insight onto some some different uh, topics. Uh, golf related and uh, recruiting related so stay tuned for that if you want to get your questions answered uh, send the questions to uh, the show email which is golf guru show at gmail.com and I appreciate all the questions We've got some great ones today uh, it's kind of interesting just wanted to share a few things with you. I, for those of you that have followed the podcast and know me, that I am a big journal guy. I just write stuff down because I um, can't remember it half the time. But my phone has sort of become my journal. Instead of writing things down and things go into my phone, I have list upon list. So I, I just came across uh, what I call thoughts on my podcast groundwork even before I started the podcast. So I thought I would share this and kind of give you a little vision of you know where... I want to take this podcast, and for those of you who have followed, you know, I'm sure you can sort of get the gist of, of what's going on here, but I'm just going to go through the bullet points that I've gotten written down on this list I thought was kind of interesting to kind of look back, you know, two months ago when uh, I thought of this idea. So, number one, topics to help other teachers improve their teaching and coaching skills. So, obviously, we're doing that with the Guru Fridays and also talking to some of the coaches out there. Number two, dissect and unpack the personal and professional habits of high-performing coaches. And hopefully you can get that vibe from my interview questions and some of the, the places that I'm going with these coaches where it's not just about technical information or you know how they're working with their players as much as it is how are they living their life and some of the tactics and influences in their daily habits and things that have helped them along the way uh, with life skills, which I think is synonymous with being a top coach. I don't think you can be a top coach without having good interpersonal development skills, as well as understanding the information and, and having the swing knowledge and the teaching knowledge. I think it goes hand in hand. So I'm sure you can get that vibe. Bullet point number three is to help present a multitude of ways to be successful in the teaching business from different perspectives and, and philosophies, uh, which obviously is, is the vibe as well. So hopefully you're getting that from the podcast. Number four, and I put selfishly as the first, selfishly picking the brains of high-performing teachers, coaches, and training, uh, then sharing it with the world so we can all get better. And that's what it's all about. And I thought I've had so many amazing uh relationships that I've built with other coaches and friends of mine and I'm constantly on the phone texting or or talking to them on the phone or or at conferences or the PGA show or whatnot and I thought why can't I take that information and you know give it to you guys out there so that's really the big goal here of this podcast is to share with you the things that have helped me along the way and just basically passing it passing it on to somebody like yourself or uh, I thought Scott Fawcett put it really well. One of the questions I asked him was basically I'm giving information to my 25 year old self. Not that you have to be 25 and, and a new teacher to enjoy this podcast, but you get the gist. 
next bullet point says, I've been on a personal development journey since 2003 and have learned so many things through books, CDs, videos, papers, and now podcasts that I've been able to apply and improve my teaching skills, and I want to share that with the world. Next, I am a passionate, I'm very passionate about mentoring and helping others, as you, can, as you know. And for those of you who have visited me, I, I really am always uh, honored when somebody asks me to, to help them to think that I could, could really give them some insight and maybe make a, an effect on their career is, is a big deal to me. Focusing on helping and improving other young coaches is the way of growing the game from the inside out. There's too much bad information being spewed to golfers that are trying to get better, so I'm trying to give them some guidance and direction to those who seek it. And I think that's a, that's a mouthful right there that we could spend a whole hour talking about, but that's all I'm trying to do is, is bring the accurate information that we're all talking about you know, amongst ourselves and, you know, we see bad information given out there that, that makes our, our eyes roll a lot of times. So that's where I'm at. That's sort of, you know, my heart. And that's where I'm taking this podcast. And I appreciate you listening. So the mini rant is over. And let's get to our first question that comes from Grasshopper. Grasshopper asks, what is an effective drill for shallowing without laying the club face wide open? That's a great question because as we know, a lot of times we'll see a proper transition that tends to open the club face, right? A lot of times when we get the sweet spot behind the hand path, which we're all trying to, to get our students to do, it doesn't work out because we haven't effectively uh, moved the club face into a position where it can be functional. So this is a drill that I've been using for, for several years, but I've sort of modified it a little bit along the way uh, as I, again, get more information and, and get smarter and more effective as a teacher. But I call it the mini pump drill. And, you know, it's kind of, it stems from an old school, old school drill that I think I saw maybe David Ledbetter do a hundred years ago where, you know, we're working on transition. Maybe somebody's, you know, over rotating and early downswing club and the hands are moving out clubs moving out steepening moving across the ball so instead of letting that player pump the club all the way back to the top of the swing I will have them basically go from normal setup go into their backswing and we're assuming that we're happy with you know the backswing that we've that we've got uh, we're working into transition I will move the player into what we call P6 or, or early or a basically delivery position. And when we do that, we've got to make sure that we are helping them understand. And I do this by basically moving the player, putting my hands on them and, and, and twisting the handle a little bit into lead wrist flexion and sort of curling the, the lead wrist as you would if you were screwing a screwdriver uh, or using the motorcycle analogy or metaphor and making sure that the club face at P6 is, I'd say, matching the spine angle or, or right angles to the spine, uh, which is what I, I like to see. And the club head or the sweet spot of the club would be slightly inside the hand path, which the hand path would be sort of down and out slightly I don't know how many how many inches away from the the right uh, thigh. I'm trying to paint a picture here for you, but basically I'm going to set them up and I'm going to have them recognize that that's where the club needs to be, and then I'm going to allow them to pump the club back up to the top at only about halfway. So we're only going to move the club up slightly and then pump it back down. And it's important to get your players to do this super slow. I think when when players are doing drills like this it obviously takes some patience so it's not going to work for everybody you got those type a guys that don't want to uh, sit still it's probably going to be a difficult drill for them but if they pump it up and down don't let them get back to the top of the swing and then bring them down to impact and show them okay here's what impact's going to look like handle's going to be slightly towards the target torso is going to be open Shoulders are going to be relatively square for this player that's coming out out the end. 
pressure is going to be left and so on. And then bring him back to, to delivery again and have him pump and then have him hit some shots from that sort of half to three quarter uh, position. And they will start to figure out because the club face is feeling a lot more closed ish in uh, early downswing to delivery that the ball is not going to go to the right. Cause what happens when most of your players, you ask, you know, they've been slicers and that you ask them to, you know, drop the club more to the inside. The first thing that they're going to think is why am I swinging to the right when that's where I'm, where my typical miss is. So you've got to marry that transition sort of shallowing, uh, move with helping them understand how to how to solve the problem of the club face which is the lead wrist flexing a little bit so a great great question uh hope that helps you to understand that and give, gives you a picture and you know really what i'll do a lot of times is i'll actually start them from impact and reverse engineer it back into delivery which if you have if you're having trouble out there with students i would go backwards and i've really had a lot of success with the uh, reverse engineering, what I call uh, reversing the the process, where I will actually go from impact and then I'll show them where they are, sort of P8 post impact, where the club's going to move, how their body's going to feel, where their arms and their hands are going to are going to move, and then I will move them backwards into delivery and then have them hit a shot. And I've had a lot of success with that with guys I've been struggling with. You know, if I if I can't get them to do it relatively quickly in the first lesson I will go that route uh, which I think is can be very very helpful so the next question uh, from the same individual here from grasshopper in your opinion can a more square club face encourage more body rotation uh, more open hips and torso at impact than an open club face late in the downswing and my answer to that is absolutely Uh, it's imperative that the club face be sort of square-ish to the body, like I said, right angles to the spine at halfway down, I think, in order for uh, that player to have a reason to start opening up. If the club face is open and you can play with an open club face, you have to have a slower body rotation and a lot more forearm rotation or flip through the ball. Been plenty of players that play play that well, uh, that way. Uh, it's not my... Uh, ideal situation and that's not really where I want my students to be but uh, definitely and that sort of goes with the first question is I think getting them to understand how the hands and arms move in early downswing and impact is crucial uh, to marrying a proper sequence in the downswing so again going back to that first drill if you can put them just put them in the delivery position where the sweet spots behind the hand path Lead wrist is, is moving towards flexion and the club face is, is where we talked about. That will help them to understand that the torso can now open up. So I almost want to put my players in a position to where they feel like they're going to hit it left and then fig, have them figure out how to not hit it left, which is basically getting the torso open early, getting the right arm to, to be soft and passive, and that's going to help to, to promote a more stable club face through impact so great questions grasshopper uh keep them coming so let's get to question number three john graham explained how he uses the poker chip drill to assess a student's coordination and adaptability what are some other ways games tasks etc you can assess coordination and adaptability it would seem to be valuable to have an idea of what the student can and can't do before designing games tasks and skills this question comes from Testing Tommy. Uh, great question, Testing Tommy. As you know, uh, I do the same thing with uh, with my players where I use a poker chip or a ball mark to really test their touch because the ultimate thing is being able to match up uh, their distance choice with uh, the amount of curve they're going to play. And I think that's, that's the ultimate uh, litmus test for putting. So... Some of the other ones that I do, uh, again, most of them I've I've stole from my friend John Graham. Shout out to JG. Uh, The rope drill for for green reading is fantastic. If you have, you go to Lowe's and get a rope. I call it the Black Mamba. And I'll just have them uh, draw out the putt that they see. And it's very interesting. It's not even so much 
that I look at how well they draw the putt out. It's more about their body language and the way they process uh, the information and, and the way they look at the picture. So, you know, the, the side of the putt that they start, do they start from the hole and work backwards? Do they start from the ball and work towards the hole? Can give you some real insight into how they're thinking. And then just asking open-ended questions, I think, is, is a main thing that I do in my sort of interview process if I've got time uh, with especially a high-level player. You know, asking them questions like which putt uh, do they like, which which putts do they not like, which ones scare them the most, um, things that are going to give you some some ideas of, of really how they're they're thinking. And I would say, you know, that green reading test is awesome. And then, you know, getting to understand that you know putting or having the apex as as a target is not ideal and it really doesn't work. So it's a good it's a good lead in to a lot of uh, downfalls of poor putters, even at high at high level players that I work with a lot of mini tour guys that it will, they'll tell me they're aiming at the top of the break or the or the apex and and it's just an aha moment to to show them what a true picture of the putt looks like by having them draw it out and then helping him at the end uh, get a picture of the putt and then asking them you know once they've uh, looked at the putt and after we do the poker chip explaining to them that you know this is not the hole this is simply the distance choice and then having them tell you where the hole would be on an ideal uh, scenario of the putt that you're showing them uh, is very very good and it tells you how they're perceiving the picture of the putt as well uh, another test that I like to do just for touch is the, the leapfrog drill it's it's a simple uh, drill where uh, you have to – I'll set up uh, poker chip tees or ball marks at sort of 0, 6, and 12 feet on a relatively flat surface and have them roll the first ball that has to get past the 6-foot chip or tee, and then every ball has to go a little farther than the previous ball. And I think that becomes one of my staple drills for a lot of my players that I think is really good. Um but you'll also get some insight into to really how good their touch is. So, you know, as far as, you know, coordination and adaptability, uh, that's the first thing you can probably help your, your students with, regardless of the skill level, is, uh, is their distance choice, their, their speed. And, you know, then you can sort of reverse engineer into, you know, using some technology like Blast Motion or uh, I use Sam Putt Lab a ton. Uh, after I test them, and get them to understand that, you know, the error of their poor putting is either the ball's not starting in the right place, uh, they're not picking the right intention, you know, or it's it's pu- it's purely speed and green reading, then, you know, they're really open to making some changes, whether it's some mechanical changes. But it, it definitely, the more information that I've gained, I'd say, uh, through my putting research, the less I change strokes, definitely on the front end, but even on the back end, I'm real careful to change too many of the components that are matching up. It's just like full swing. So hope that helps. Uh, it's a, it's, I've got some really cool stuff that we're kind of working on uh, with putt dispersion. I'll kind of give you a little insight there. I was talking with my staff yesterday at, at our uh, training day. And talking to Scott Fawcett and listening to his stuff sort of gave me some ideas of how I can apply uh, shot dispersion to putting and then how that I can help my players make better decisions on their distance choice and intention on different types of types of putts. Very, very early. I don't know where I'm going with this. It's just, again, me thinking about stuff that could help my players and something that, that I've been really curious about. Uh, so I'll kind of keep you updated on that. I have no no information that I can share with you at this point that's going to help you, but just just some things that are that I'm working on. All right, so question number four comes from Routine Ronnie, and his question is, do you have any preferences for pre-round warm-up routines for your players? And, you know, I think this could go in a lot of different directions, but I'm just going to tell you what, what I tell my players, and especially like my, my elite juniors that – 
you know, a lot of times really don't have any idea what they should do uh, before a tournament round. Uh, so I think I think structure and consistency is very very important, and obviously it, it can it can be derailed uh, with some courses they play. Maybe the the range you know, is not very big and they have to wait or, you know, maybe they don't have a chipping area. So obviously it can be, it can be altered a little bit, but here would be my perfect scenario. If you have, you know, a really nice golf course where you've got all that available to you is I think timing is very important. So I like my players to get to, to the facility, I would say at least an hour and 15 minutes uh, before and want to be like ready to warm up an hour before their tee time. Uh, and I say an hour and 15 minutes, I remember, I think it was Lee Trevino or, or one of the, the legends of the game. Uh, I heard this a long time ago saying that they got there early, even if they had to like hang around the locker room, you don't want to ever be rushing uh, and get out of your routine. So even if you got there a little early, you don't have to start your routine early. You can just hang out, you know, get something to drink, something to eat. But I want to be ready to start my routine an hour before and I've flipped it a little bit lately because I used to go straight to the range or have my kids go straight to the range. Now I actually want them to start putting. And the reason that I want them to do that is because it's a good way to kind of loosen up. Because so when you're putting, you're bending over a little bit more. You know, you're, you're stretching your back. You're stretching your hamstrings. And it's a good way to kind of loosen up and kind of get a feel. So when they're on the putting green, you know, early on, all they're doing is just trying to get the speed. You don't necessarily have to be doing drills, even though I I don't mind that. I don't mind uh, some of my players putting a Vizio mat down or an eyeline mirror or something just to give them confidence. But I want them getting the speed, and I want them to see a lot of golf balls going in the hole. So when they're working on speed, I don't even care if they putt to a hole. I mean, putt to a tee, putt to the fringe. Like I said, at junior tournaments or, or you know, a lot of tournaments, there's a lot of people in the putting greens. You may not even have a hole available. So... Just rolling golf balls and just getting a feel for the pace, I think, is important and loosening your back, doing a little stretching. And, you know, obviously you can do some stretching in the locker room or, or prior to, to you getting there as recommended. So I would do that for, you know, 10, 15 minutes or so. Then make your way to the range. And then when they get to the range, I would definitely start with small swings with sand wedges, your heaviest club, just to kind of get loosened up. And then understand that, you know, you're not – you're not working on stuff so much. You're just down there just loosening up, not really too concerned with what the ball's doing initially. If you've done your homework and you're, pre- you're prepared, it shouldn't be a big deal. You're just trying to get loose and trying to get ready, get your mind right. So I will definitely have them start out with a short club, and I'll vary and you know, I'll let the player make up their mind. But usually I'll go either odds or evens. So you can go like pitching wedge, eight, six, four, or you know go with the odd clubs depending on how they're feeling and then go up to three wood and then driver. And then I'll go back to sand wedge at the end to kind of loosen it up again. And then I'll tell them whatever they're going to hit off the first tee. That's what I want you to hit your last three golf balls. And I want you to go through your routine, sort of visual, start visualizing what you want to happen uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes when you go to the first tee. So, you know, practice as much, simulation and visualization as you can uh, before you go to the first tee. And if you got a couple more minutes, you may hit a couple of chip shots uh, in that 25 to 35 minute window where you're at the range uh, if it's available. If not, you can just hit some little pitch shots, you know, on the range just to kind of get a feel for the turf and your, in your, your shorter motion. But that's what I do. Uh, that's what I encourage my, my players to do. So a great question. All right, last question uh, from the same uh, same individual. So we'll call him we'll call him Routine Ronnie as well. Is what have you found helpful to tell players to eat and drink on the course, and how often? And that's a great question. And this this is something that you know I'm not a nutrition expert, but I have talked to enough people that know. Uh, Doctor McCabe has given me some great information on what he tells his players. Um, I think it's important that you do eat breakfast, you know, depending on your, your tea time, a lot of times that can affect what you eat, you know, prior to your round. But once you get into your, into your round, I try, and then this is me again, going with my son that plays a lot of tournament golf. 
when I'm assisting him uh, carrying the, the backpack cooler, uh, watching his rounds uh, with food and drink, I try to get him to eat something every three to four holes, even if it's just a, a piece of a sandwich. And one, it's it's for the nutrition value, but also I think especially when maybe they're having a tough stretch in the round, it helps slow them down. And that's the thing I learned from Dr. McCabe is he talked about, you know, when you when your players are eating, tell them to really focus on what they're eating and just sort of even get off to the side. And, you know, if it's a, or there's a weight on a par three or, or a hole that it's a good time for them sort of re- to reset their mind and reset their body and just focus on what they're eating. I, I'd say the, the go to's have been you know, really high protein stuff, not too much sugar if possible. Um, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are, are really good. I've heard a lot of coaches uh, say that that's good for a lot of their players. Uh, nuts, you know, cashews, that type of thing I think is really good. I don't recommend high sugar, like, you know, protein bars are okay. Uh, some of the, the, the first tea bars and the 10th tea bars I think are pretty good, but I wouldn't load up on those. Those might be like a once around type of deal. Uh, but I would rather have small and you got to have things that are easy to eat, obviously, when you're walking and and playing golf. So that's sort of my recommendations. Uh, drinking, I, I, I like the water mixed with like the Amino Vital or the BioSteel better than the Gatorades and the Powerades. Uh, maybe one Powerade around, but I would, again, keep the sugar on a minimum because you get those really high spikes, I think, from your players that could be uh, not so beneficial with their emotions, especially how they're playing. So I like to have low sugar products, the, the sports drink, the mixtures, the sports drinks are really easy to control. So I'll just use the, the water and the, the amino vitals and the, and the bio steels. Amino vitals seem to be a little bit easier for most players just from my uh, experience. So that's what I do. Try to you know keep them hydrated. You got to make sure that your players understand how important it is to eat because when they get hungry, they lose focus, and especially the, your emotional kids, and I'm talking about the elite juniors and the junior players out there, they really can lose focus and not realize that it's because they're they're hungry or they're low on energy. So keeping their energy up, just the little bites of food here and there, every three or four holes could be the difference between uh, a poor finish and a really good finish. So great question. Hope that helps. I appreciate uh, all the questions and Uh, routine Ronnie good stuff all right so before we wrap up one again reminder send your email questions into golfgurushow at gmail.com golfgurushow at gmail.com or you can hit me up on the twitter at golfgurutv or instagram at golfgurutv so i hope you guys enjoyed this uh, it's not easy doing the solo mission. I miss my uh, my co-host uh, Seth and Robbie, and we will have some interviews coming down the pipe here real soon. Leave me a review. I would love to get a review. Let me know how you how you think about what's going on here. I'm really enjoying uh, this podcast and being able to kind of give you guys some insight into into what I do on a daily basis and some of the things that I've learned along the way. So, as I always say study, practice, teach, and then pass it on. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.